Hey guys, Paul here, and today I'm going to give you my five top tips for running in the winter. Okay, so it's that time of year, it's cold outside, maybe some snow, ice, and a lot of places are giving you their their top tips as to what to do when the weather gets bad like this. A lot of the videos and articles that I've, I've seen this time of year are normally based around what gear is recommended for running in this, these hyper conditions. This video is going to be a little bit different, it's more looking at the whole um, area of running in bad weather. I'm going to be looking at planning, safety, gear obviously that you should use, nutrition, hydration, all those kind of things. So let's get started. Tip number one is planning. Winter isn't doesn't come out of the blue. We know we know it comes around every year. Um, you have your training plan. If you're training for something, you know what runs you're going to be doing during the week. Now, whilst the weather forecast might not be a hundred percent accurate each and each and every day, when it comes to getting blizzards and really bad storms terribly cold uh, conditions, temperatures, etc. It's generally not too bad. So when you've got your plan for the week, check what the weather forecast is. If it says that it's gonna be massive negative degrees on Sunday when you're meant to be doing your long run, but the Saturday it's gonna be, it's gonna be warmer, then maybe switch your run to the Saturday. Um, if there's gonna be a blizzard or something on a day when it's gonna be an easy day, maybe you take the day off or maybe you can go swimming or you could go, go and do something on a treadmill instead. Um, it is essential to plan ahead. If you don't plan, you're gonna wake up one morning and you're gonna maybe force yourself to go out in conditions that you really shouldn't do and you can get injured, you can, I mean, there's risks of hypothermia, there's all sorts of things that can go wrong. You could be hit by a car that's out of control because it's icy conditions and you've gone out to run on a road that maybe you shouldn't have done. So plan ahead. Or well, tip number two is the route that you're gonna be doing. This is especially um, for if you've got a long run to do. If you're training for a spring marathon, um, you can, for the odd week here and there, or the odd long run, you can move things around. But if you're training for a spring marathon, the chances are you're gonna have a block of several weeks when the weather's gonna be bad and you're gonna to have to go out. So maybe you need to look at if you've got to go and do a 20 mile run, you need to look at the route that you're gonna be doing. Again, if, if the weather's gonna be bad, if you have access to a treadmill, maybe you can, you're not gonna do 20 miles on a treadmill. I would not recommend it. Even as a last resort, running 20 miles on a treadmill, you're gonna be bored after, well, you're gonna to get to maybe halfway if you're lucky, um, and then you're not gonna to wanna to do any more and it is so boring, it doesn't give you the variety of running outside, even if you've got videos to watch or music to listen to or whatever, you, I wouldn't recommend it. But if you have access to one, maybe you can run some distance outside, then do some on, the, some on a treadmill, or you could maybe warm up on a treadmill, go for 10 miles outside and then do a cool down on the treadmill afterwards. Um, another, another thing is, I live out here in the middle of nowhere, um, I have to go and run on country roads and farm tracks and they very rarely, they're always the last ones to get ploughed or gritted and treated when it's icy. So when I'm going out for a long run or if I've got to go out and do speed work, I'm not going to want to go and run on ice. I can't do speed work on ice and even if I'm going for a long run and it's icy and the roads are bad, so I will jump in the car if that's my option, I'll jump in the car and drive five miles into the local village and I will run round a three or four mile loop and stay in the village on pavements. So that's an option. Before I've lived in places where I've had a one mile route out in one direction and then come back and a one mile route out in the other direction. So it's a, basically a four mile lap, but I'm only ever one mile from the house. So if the weather changes, um, a blizzard comes in or the wind gets up or I just get cold and I need to get home, I'm only ever a mile from home. So even if I had to walk, it's only a 10, 15 minutes, even if I'm at one of the furthest point from home, it's still going to take maybe 15 minutes to get back. Whereas if you go on a big out and back or a big loop, um, a 20 mile loop, if something happens at miles 10, 11, 12, you could be eight miles 
eight to 10 miles from home, which even if you've got, even if you phone somebody and they come and get you, you could be sitting out there for an hour. So keep an eye on the route, especially if it might be that the only place you've got where the pavements have been treated, there might be a block around your house that's a mile loop. If it's safe, it's been treated, there's street lights and you're running at night, just run around there. It's better than nothing, okay? Even if you, you're meant to do 20 miles, even if you do something, it's better than nothing. If there's a track you can go to, if there's a park, even running on grass, even if it's frozen grass, it's gonna give you a bit more grip than running on a frozen pavement. But if you can find a pavement, even if it's only a one mile loop or a two mile loop or something that you can do, it's boring, but you get it in, it's still something and you're maybe gonna to have to do it a couple of times, but then the weather will pick up and away you go. Tip number three is the gear you're gonna be using. Um, you do need to be sensible with what you take um, and what, what you're wearing and starting from the ground up. There's a great video from uh, Sage Canada, uh, VO2, Max, VO2 Max Productions, which I'll, I'll put a link down below. Um, where he shows you how to very cheaply, using some sheet metal screws, add some grip to your trainers. But if you do have to go out and run on, on ice, if the only place you can go, it's covered, there's maybe a thin layer of snow or there's ice and you wanna go out, it's a, it's a great video. As I say, I'll put, a, I'll put a link down below. If you've got um, some trail shoes that you, can, that you can go out in, they're gonna give you more grip than you don't wanna be going out in snow or ice with racing flats or even just generally normal trainers, if you've got some, some trail shoes with a bit more grip, they're gonna help you. Um, and then going up from there, obviously try and uh, have some warm socks, but be aware that if you put thicker socks on, it's gonna change the fit of your trainers. So although your feet may be warm, you might get blisters or sore bits on your feet. You might rub something up because you're wearing thicker socks. So obviously the fit of the trainer is gonna be different. Um, on your legs, if it is, I mean, if it's anywhere near freezing, I've got my running tights that I wear. Um, there's various different sorts that you can get, different prices. Uh, make sure that they are, if they're, they're proper running tights so they're, and they're thermal, so they've got the moisture wick, wicking fabric. Um, the last thing you want, and I've had this happen to me before, um, when I ended up racing in Florida and thought I'm gonna turn up and it's gonna be lovely and warm and it was like the second coldest day they'd ever had. It had even snowed the day before. It, had, it was around about freezing and I didn't have the right clothing for it. I just had cycling shorts and normal shorts. Um, the cycling shorts were not thermal and there is a photo somewhere of me running along and there's ice patches on the front of my legs on my cycling shorts because they didn't wick the moisture away correctly running into a wind, it froze, and I suffered the following week. I could barely walk for a week because my quad muscles had just frozen basically for the three and a half hours that I was out there. So make sure you've got the right uh, trousers that are gonna wick the, the moisture away. And then uh, normally we'll have overshorts. Sometimes I even have underwear on if it's really cold, if you're talking minus seven, minus 10 C, then Maybe I'll even have underwear on underneath my running tights. I have over shorts on, normal shorts on the top. Um, and then when you get to your top half, obviously it's layers. Um, again, if it's around about freezing, I'll have a thermal top on. Um, if it's way below freezing, I'll maybe even have another top over that before I then have a running jacket on top. Um, the thing with to remember with, with the layers is when you go out the door, you actually want to feel a little bit cold. When you first go out the door, if you go out and you feel warm, you're gonna end up having a problem because as you start running, you're gonna start sweating, you're gonna warm up and you're gonna be producing so much sweat that your thermal layer is just gonna become sodden and although it can wick the moisture away, there'll be so much that it can't get rid of it and then once your thermal layer is soaking wet, if the wind gets up, you slow down, you cool down, you are gonna chill very, very quickly. So the idea is when you go out, if you feel warm, you've probably got too many layers on. Um, if you go out and you feel a little bit chilly, then that's about gonna be about right, because once you get going, you're gonna, you're gonna start sweating a little bit. 
the, your thermal layer is going to start doing what it needs to do, which is getting that moisture away from you, but keeping you warm. And if the wind does get up or you do slow down or in your cool down at the end when everything's cooling down, um, you're not going to freeze quite as much as you would do if you sweated an unbelievable amount because you were too hot. And as you get to, if you think about your extremities, your hands, um, I would recommend having uh, several different pairs of gloves for different conditions, but also so you can even layer your gloves up. I, I have problems with my fingers because I have arthritis in them from too many years being a software developer in a previous life. So I have really bad circulation. I need to keep my fingers warm. So I generally will have a pair of running gloves. I do have a pair of gloves that are their split thing or normal, normal gloves, but they also have a mitten section that you can then put over the top. So obviously mittens, it keeps your fingers closer together. So then the warmth of your fingers warm each other, all the other fingers up. So mittens are generally warmer. Um, so you can do that. I also then have some woolly gloves that I can put over the top of my running gloves if I need to. Um, I've also got liners for my ski gloves. That if it's really cold, then they're quite good. Um, I can put hand warmers in if I need to, like from when the spare ones I've got from going skiing. So then they'll keep the palm of my hand warm, which helps to then warm my fingers. Um, and if you haven't got mittens, I, it looks a bit silly, but I, I do it quite often is I will pull my fingers out of the actual, the finger parts of the gloves and I'll just clench my, my, my hand up into a ball in the middle part of the glove. And then that keeps that a lot warmer. It's not the most comfortable, but in a, in a push, if I go out and I've only got my, my running gloves with me and I don't have the extra uh, woolly gloves to put on over the top, I put my, I will pull my fingers out and get them into a ball and that just takes the worst of it off, at least for me with the problems I have with my fingers. So that's something to, something to remember. But if you can have two or three pairs of gloves for the different conditions, if you can get, um, you can get mitten over gloves. Um, they're quite good if it is snowing or raining, then it keeps your hands dry. The worst thing. Now, I would also recommend you have a buff. You can use that as a hat. You can have it over your face. If it's really that cold, breathing in cold air, if you've got asthma or anything, um, respiratory issues, then breathing in really cold air, if it's negative degrees, that can be painful. It can lead to problems. So a buff that you can, you can just use it to keep your, your neck warm. You can put it over your nose and mouth. You can even use it as a hat if, if that's what you want. I'll generally have mine on as a hat. If I need to, I can pull it down. Generally, I don't because using it as a hat, it gets quite sweaty. So putting it down over my face, last thing I want to do. But in an emergency, then I can use it if I need to. Um, you can have, there's various different hats you can have. You can go out with a woolly hat. Again, no, that can get wet, soggy, not particularly pleasant. And they're not really very small then to just shove in your, shove in your pocket. So there, you can get a proper running hat that's a lot tighter fitting. It's lighter weight. Again, it's going to be moisture wicking. Um, so it'll, it'll hopefully keep your head warm. If you need to take it off, then it's small enough you'll be able to put it in your pockets. Um, so that's really top to bottom with the gear uh, to try and keep you warm. You don't want to over overdo it. As I said, you don't want to be too hot going out the door, but you also don't want to be too cold. Tip number four, you've got to be realistic with what's going to happen when you go out for a run you'll see an awful lot of articles and videos and advice about what to do when the weather's too hot in the summer, when it's 15, 20 degrees hotter than you're used to and how you need to slow down and take it easy, hydrate, and your performance isn't gonna be as good. You don't see quite as many articles saying that the same thing happens when it gets cold. When it gets, there's a perfect bit in the middle that's perfect marathon conditions that if you go above or below, it's not optimal. Now. When you get down, going down to zero degrees or below or whatever it happens to be, it's not as bad, shall we say, as when it gets up to 
20, 30, 35 degrees um, C going hot because when it gets colder, you can put more clothes on, but you're then gonna struggle because having more clothes on, it weighs you down. You're not running as, as, as natural as you would be if you were in your proper running gear. When you get hot, there's nothing you can do. You're just gonna sweat. You can't take your skin off. There's only so many clothes that you can take off. Um, there's only so much liquid you can get into your body. So you are really limited at the top end when that happens. But you also need to be aware that when it gets cold, you're not gonna be able to run as fast because although you might be able to keep your core warm um, and you might feel all right, if you're running on icy conditions, you're gonna be slipping, so you've gotta take it easy. If you're running in snowy conditions, again, you're not gonna be running at the proper pace that you're, do you're meant to be doing. If you've got all these extra clothes on, you're not gonna be running in your natural rhythm. Um, it's gonna upset you a little bit, it's gonna feel a bit strange. Okay, eventually you'll get used to it, but you're still not going to be running as well as you would if you were just in your singlet and shorts and trainers and that's it and you're going out the door and it's a nice sunny day. So you need to be realistic and aware that if you're going out to do a speed work session or a tempo session, take a little bit off of what you're expecting to do. Don't beat yourself up or don't try to even hit what you're meant to hit. Do what's safe. If you've got a heart rate monitor, you'll be able to tell how hard you're working. So you'll be able to know, and this goes for if the weather is so bad, maybe you take the run inside and you do it on the treadmill. And then you have the issue of, well, how fast do I need to go uh, on the treadmill to make it the equivalent of being outside? And the general rule of thumb is if you, as long as you put the treadmill to 1% uh, gradient, that's pretty much equivalent to running outside. Now I'll put a link in the description down below. There's a couple of charts um, conversion charts on the web that show you exactly what if you put the different percentages of gradient what the equivalent outside running speed is um, so you can match that up if you do have to do runs inside uh, so that you make sure you're getting to the right paces but you also have to be aware if you're running on a treadmill inside even at one percent gradient that's basically running completely flat so it'd be like running on a track and if you're training for a marathon and you're doing a tempo run you meant to be doing a tempo run, it's all very well. Yes, okay, I hit seven minute miles for every single one. But if you're running outside, it's going up and down all the time. Um, you might not even really notice that it's going up and down all the time, but it's not completely flat. You're not running on a track. So you don't want to fall into the trap that, okay, I'm just going to do every tempo run because the weather's bad. I'm just going to go and do my speed work on the treadmill because I can easily hit my paces because you'll be, you'll have a bit of a surprise when you then come to running outside when the weather gets a bit better and you'll suddenly be like, well, why can't I hit these paces? It's equivalent to it, but it's not the same as running outside exactly. As I said, for this tip, you've got to be realistic. Don't get upset if you can't hit your times. It's not the be all and end all. If your heart rate monitor tells you that you've been still hitting the right kind of zones for the workout, doesn't matter if you were meant to hit seven minutes for your tempo run, but you only managed 7.30. If you're running through snow that's a few inches deep, which can happen in certain sections, you could be a minute, a mile slower, but your heart rate's still gonna tell you you're in the right zone because it's that much harder to, to run in those conditions. So be realistic um, and don't worry about it. The, your training plan, as I've said before, many times before, the training plan is every single run that you've done in this training plan, and other training plans added all together. So one run or even a couple of runs that aren't perfect, not gonna make a big difference on race day. But tip number five is mainly for uh, doing long runs, which is the nutrition and hydration. These things, they're just as important as if you've got, if you're going out and you're doing a long run and it's too hot. Now there's different things that you do need to consider though. Um, I've had issues, I run with a camelback for my long runs. Um, I don't like holding stuff in my hand, so I don't take a bottle with me. Um, but running with a camelback, you have the straw that comes over. The last two weeks I've had problems, that straw's frozen. Even this week I put hot water or hot juice, I warmed up my juice um, that I was taking with me in the backpack before I put it in thinking that would be fine. 
and within three miles, so less than 20 minutes, that had frozen. I blew back the, as you're supposed to, you blow the juice back into the, into the, the bladder in the camelback so that there's nothing to freeze in the tube, but a little bit got stuck in there, couldn't blow it all out, um, all in, and that froze, and that gave me some problems. Um, if you do do that and you do blow the juice back into the bladder, do be aware that when you then take your next drink, the the liquid is then under pressure from what you've bl from the the air you've blown back in, so it is going to come out a bit faster. Now, the tip I would give to help avoid that, if you run with a Camelback and you have these issues or have had these issues, is to actually when you start off, and you maybe don't need a drink for the first few miles, um, is to have the the actual straw not down the front, but have it tucked into the back and um, with the bladder. Um, if you've got warm juice in there, it'll keep it warm and stop it from freezing. You'll also have the, you'll also have the warmth from your back warming it up as well. If you shove it right down the back of the, the bladder, it does mean you're going to have to stop um, to sort it out anyway. But that's something that in cold weather, when you've got lots of gloves on um, and things stuffed in pockets or whatever, you're going to have to probably do anyway. Um, so be aware, warm up your juice. Juice when they're on their long run, it can you might want something a bit more refreshing. But be aware if you do put cold stuff in, it shouldn't freeze in a Camelback. They are reasonably well insulated, but being colder, there is always that issue. Now, if you do like to run with a bottle, you shouldn't have that issue. Um, if you're the type of person that likes to go out and drop bottles off at various points, be aware that if it's below freezing, these things will freeze very quickly. So the bottles towards the end of your run that you might be going to pick up, they could be frozen and then they're going to be useless when you get there. At least with the Camelback, it's just in the tube. As soon as I put the tube in, within a mile or two, it's defrosted, I can drink it. If you've got a bottle that's frozen, that's not going to defrost for a long time, no matter what you do. Now, the other side of having your hydration is the nutrition if you're taking stuff to eat. Um, now, this is, it's difficult because everybody has their own personal favorites and you can't just go changing what you're going to have um, willy-nilly. You can't just change and say, well, I'm suddenly gonna have something different to eat. If you've always had gels, and you know your stomach's fine with them, then that's what you're going to want to have. But again, be aware. They're going if you've got them in a pocket or you've got them in if if you take a backpack, they're going to freeze. And if you've ever if you've ever tried to eat a congealed gel, um, and I don't like them at the best of times, but when they've got cold and they're starting to freeze, and you've got to try and you've got your juice. If there's any issues with that, and you've got a gel and it is really thick, trying to get one of those down your throat is not a pleasant experience. And you can run with them in your shorts, you can run with them in your gloves. Um, you would think having them in your pockets might keep them warm, but I've found that having food, if you're running into any, well, with the, the way my layers wick the sweat away and then the wind comes onto them, it means that what's in my pockets generally ends up freezing. It gets condensation on it from the heat coming from your body, but then the cold air of any wind coming onto you will freeze whatever's in your front or back pockets. Um, so you need to be aware of that. So if you are gonna take gels or chews or anything, anything that is normally chewy or less viscous at room temperature, if you're gonna take that, you need to be aware you've got to keep it warm somehow. So in your gloves, in your shorts, however you can do it, if you're gonna use those or else you're gonna have a problem when it comes to eating them. <clears throat> now, if you want, I mean, my advice would be to have something that is normally solid at room temperature. So when it gets cold, it's still solid. Now, you, you can have things like there's, um, Kendall mint cake, so it's this, like sugary um, sugar cubes, even things like things like that. You can have granola bars, that kind of stuff. That's maybe a bit that's a bit harder, but um, things that you can chew because they're still when they're designed that when you eat them and chew them, they're going to break up. Um, something like Kendall mint cake and sugar cubes, they're going to dissolve. So although they're solid, 
you put it in your mouth, um, you have a bit of a drink, it's gonna dissolve you. Lucozaid tablets, dextrose tablets, glucose tablets, that kind of stuff, they're designed to be chewed, they're designed to break up in your mouth and dissolve with liquid. So maybe have some of those as a backup if you take gels and then they're absolutely disgusting. I mean, um, if you're the sort of person that likes the chocolate or the coffee ones when they congeal and get really thick, trying to have that with that taste that's not good, you might want to have a backup. So think about taking even just some sugar cubes, something that's... Um, so that's it guys. I would be interested if anyone has any comments down below as to what your tips for running in the cold weather are. I am always um, so living in the northeast of Scotland. I have four or five months of this every year and I am more than more than willing or more than happy to have people <laughs> suggest stuff that I can go and use because I find it just as difficult to throw myself out the door every day to go and do my runs when it's when there's snow on the ground, when it's negative degrees and it's freezing cold and I don't want to do it. So if there's anyone got any comments, please leave them down below and I will gladly read them. Thanks for watching.